called the writings uh, section. Uh, so contents a little differently from uh, the original Hebrew. It, it really messed me up um, after coming out of seminary and, um, and coming to my first church where I was used to, at, at seminary, you work in the original languages and they order the books a little, the Old Testament books are ordered a little bit differently in the Hebrew Bible than they are in the English Bible. Mm -hmm. It's the same books, they're just in a different order. They group them differently. And so, um, so I had to get used to the English Bible again when, when I was back in, in, or when I was, you know, finally in the parish. So, um, so I always have to sort of stop and think. It's sort of like when I'm working with the kids um, in confirmation class and and they're reciting their uh, the catechism to me, and I always have to actually look in the book to make sure they're getting it right because I m memorized it back when we were using King James, James and, yeah, that's and, that, and they used different language mm -hmm. then. So I always have to if I'm going to help them out if they get stuck on something, I have to go well hold on a minute let me double check it and, you know and they're kind of looking at me going come on how come I haven't memorized this <laughs> exactly. you know? I even know it. Like, really, I can do it, but, you know, if I start saying, be lie, be trace, land, or defame our neighbor, you're going to look at me and go, what? The books of the Bible, that's, that's why you had the songs that you have to sing. Yeah, yeah, I did put them to music. All right, um, let's get started, and we'll open with prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love that you've shown to us in your son Jesus Christ but we know that sometimes in our lives we just we don't see him it's hard uh, with when things are are going on and, and uh, we're struggling with all kinds of pain and, and sometimes we don't see him in our lives uh, we don't see your hand guiding us and leading us and yet we know that you're there and we know that you're taking care of us and and so give us faith mm -hmm. to trust in you through those times and uh, and then when you do bring us out of them to rejoice in you we pray in Jesus name Amen. All right. So um, the uh, starting out in the study guide, and um, by the way, we don't have anybody online yet. But if anybody's uh, catching this later on, um, there is a link right on the Esther page to download the study guide, so you can follow along. Um, and so I, I want to start out with just some background information on the Book of Esther, and. Uh, to start out with, just to get a sense of where we are in history, um, sort of what else is going on in the world uh, at the same time as this book. All right, and so um, if you look in the first column here on page one, uh, down um, about halfway down the first column, you'll see Esther became queen of Persia. All right, and so that's in 479, and this is BC, so the numbers work in reverse, and. Um, and, and so if we back up um, about 10 years, uh, 490, the Persians were defeated by the Athenians at Marathon. And so um, we've got uh, the, the Greek Empire uh, is in place. And <coughs> um, 486, Darius I died, and Xerxes I, which is um, called in, in some, uh, his, his Persian name would be Ahasuerus. Mm. Oh, yeah, uh, so remember. talk about mm -hmm. difficult yeah. to you know yeah. pronounce. Uh, oh, okay. That's why you, most translations you just see Xerxes. <laughs> <laughs> um, he ruled Persia, and so he was the king that married Esther. A uh, Latin league was formed. Um, so there is some debate about which king who actually was the the king in question here, and uh, most historians think that it was Xerxes the first um, but there is some there's some debate about that because in the Hebrew or, or the way it's it's actually written in the original language is Asuerus and um, so then okay well the problem is people have multiple names and sometimes it was sort of it's sort of like the name Jesus in in Hebrew it's Yeshua and then in Greek it's Jesus and then in Latin it's um, 
it's it's a little closer to Jesus, and and then you finally get to Jesus in English, or if you go to you know Spanish speaking country, it's Jesus, and mm-hmm. you know and, and stuff like that. And so, um, so sometimes just trying to, especially when you're going from one alphabet to another, you run into some real problems with translation, and and so they just sort of do it the best they can. Or sometimes it's just, well, this is how their name sounds. But this is what everybody that speaks this language calls them, because that's just what they're used to calling them. So, um, so you get these multiple names, and and sometimes you have people that just have more than one name, like you have. Uh, probably the best example in the New Testament is, is Peter, also called Simon, also called Cephas, and this is, there might even be one or two others that I can't think of off the top of my head, but he seems to have all kinds of different names, and, um, and so we have we have that kind of thing going on too, where people are called by different names. Maybe there's a family name, um, and then there's also a um, the sort of given name or, or something like that. Not that you care, but that's why for years and years I was listed as a male on my birth certificate oh, my because goodness. of course my parents being <laughs> immigrants they knew they wanted to name me Ruthie 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 so it came out R-U-D-Y so <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> it wasn't until I oh. went to work at uh, oh. Ohio Edison that's when I discovered it because now that's already in the late 1980s oh. when you had to Oh, you the birth certificate. Yeah. yeah. And so you found I, it. I never knew that until then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's oh. Okay. So uh, then in 485, the prophet Daniel wrote Daniel in Babylon. All right. Xer- Xerxes crushed the Egyptian and Babylonian revolts and deposed his queen Vashti, which we'll, um, we'll get to. That appears in uh, the book of Esther. All right. 483, Buddha died. All right, so you're familiar with Buddhism. This, so, so Buddhism was already had begun by the time this book was taking place, and um, and it was and Buddha was just about dead. Um, Rome was at war with Vey, so was, Rome was in place already. It was an ancient empire. Think about it. Um, and it wasn't an empire back then. Uh, Aristides was banned. I don't know who Aristides is. Um, so 41, Xerxes invades Asia. 479, Esther becomes queen of Persia. 478, Confucius died. Are you familiar with the name Confucius? Uh, Persia lost Byzantium, uh, Bosporus and Cyprus. Um, and then uh, 474, Haman plotted to kill the Jews. That's an event from the book of Esther also. Um, and then 473, Esther established the Purim feasts, and th- again, that's in the book of Esther, and that uh, those feasts go on to this day. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Dunwall ruled Britain and codified the British laws. Right? So Britain's already in place, too, at this point. 471, Socrates was born, famous uh, Greek philosopher. Um, 465, Xerxes was assassinated, and um, Artaxerxes ruled Persia. All right, so that's 465. Esther became queen 479, so if you look at their marriage, uh, it lasted, counting backwards, um, what, 14 years? So um, not a long marriage there. For a queen... It probably was. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Those queens didn't get to stay around long. Yeah. Because no. the king would get tired of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of uh, that? Isn't that typical, though? <laughs> Men. <I'm> so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have two people on. That's great. Um, all right. So, uh, for, let's see. Oh, uh, so 465 Xerxes, uh, he was the, or uh, Artaxerxes, he was the king that issued the decree um, on March 5th, 445 B.C., granting the Jews permission to rebuild Jerusalem. And, um, um, when talk? they were in Babylon? Yeah, this is, they were sort of allowed to go back. under the trees in that, that time, and he let them go back and build? That's the one? Yeah. Oh, I guess I never put them together. Wow. 
So, um, so 458, the Holy Scriptures assumed a settled form. Psalms, a collection of spiritual songs and poems used in worship and devotion, written by different authors from 1500 to 450 BC, were compiled by 1500 BC. Actually, we closer to about 1440 BC. Actually, somewhere between 1440 and 1400 was the first of the Psalms was written, and that would have been written by Moses. Um, but then uh, they were compiled over a long period of time, sort of like our hymnal. Uh, it wasn't all written by one person. Um, so, yeah, the Psalms were compiled. So you think about that. Esther didn't have the, the complete book of Psalms as we have it today. She didn't have, you know, obviously she didn't have the Old Testament because the book of Esther hadn't been written yet, right? Um, so uh, Athens sent 200 ships to help Inaris of Egypt against Persia. Athens defeated Corinth and commenced construction of the long walls of Athens. All right, 447, the building of the Parthenon. It was one of the big tourist spots today <laughs> in, in Greece. That w began in 447. So that was a full... Um, uh, Sunday night's not a good night for a man. Um, <laughs> uh, 32 years later, after Esther became queen, the Parthenon was... was the, I'll just have you do all my math for me. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, 445, Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem under the, the decree of Artaxerxes. So there we see this 20 years later. The decree went out in 465. It wasn't until 445 that Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem. And um, and uh, here we have this, I'm not going to pronounce that word, um, but marriage between patrician and plebeian, so sort of across the classes. Um, and uh, 444, the Jews began to rebuild Jerusalem under the decree of Artaxerxes, and um, uh, Antisthenes founded Cynics, a school of Greek ethics, where we get the word cynical. Oh, what to learn? Right. Is that the antithesis of a <laughs> Antisthenes? I don't know. Antisthenes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so that's that's when the, the cynics uh, started, which is, is very different how we understand the word today. It was a, a whole philosophy and not just a um, sort of an attitude. Um, all right, so 438, the Parthenon was completed. So we see it took, what, nine years uh, to build? 437, Nehemiah completed the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And so it took him eight years to, to build those walls. 436, Nehemiah organized the great synagogue in Jerusalem. 432, Manasseh was expelled from Jerusalem by Nehemiah for his refusal to put away his wife. Sambalot's daughter Manasseh built a temple, or oh, his wife Sambalot's daughter, sorry. Um, Manasseh built a temple on Mount Gerizim in Samaria and used the Pentateuch, all right? So this is the origin of the Samaritans. And so when we have later on when Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman and she says, so where's the right place to, um, to worship God? Which, you know, which temple? And then he says, you know, the days are coming that you'll worship him in spirit and in truth. And um, so this is, that goes back to, that temple goes back to 432 uh, B.C., which is, um, you know, just, uh, what, about 47 years um, after Esther became queen. So there's actually a lot of stuff going on um, in a very short period of time. Uh, 4, 427, Plato was born. 425, the prophet Malachi, the last of the Old Testament prophets, wrote Malachi. And now, um, 424, the priest Ezra wrote Ezra, um, and Nehemiah was written by Nehemiah, uh, covering 485 to 425. Esther was probably written by Ezra, and covers 479 to 424. Um, Ezra is also credited with writing First and Second Kings, originally one book. First and Second Chronicles, <coughs> also originally one book. See, they, they split it into two because you can only squeeze so much on, on a scroll and make it portable. <laughs> that, that's why they're split up. But they were originally written together. Um, and then we have the dates there for First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. Now, <coughs> nowhere does it say who the writer is. This is from tradition, and there's some debate about who the actual author is of the Book of Esther. Um, and, and we'll get to that in just a second. All right. Um, so the the next thing is to look at the consistency 
um, of, you know, is, is this an, an accurate book or not? Because every book of the Bible has had some criticism over the years. Is this, a, you know, actual historical account or not? There's a lot of people that say, oh, Esther is just a, um, it, it's, 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 it's a parable or, or, or something like that that we don't really need to, to accept it as, as a historical fact. Um, I'm, I believe that it is historical fact, um, but let's take a look at sort of the arguments for and against it um, because I think it gives us a better understanding of, of how people are looking at this book. All right. Uh, first of all, the um, the arguments in favor of it. It gives us a very accurate depiction of Xerxes' empire. There's several details um, that are given in this book that uh, archaeologists have found. Yep, this actually matches up. That um, that information that's given there uh, coincides with with what we have discovered about that book. Um, there's a banquet that occurs in Xerxes' third year. Um, and and there, that's actually covered in some of the ancient writings that have been found. Um, now I looked at that and I thought, well, don't kings have lots of banquets? You know? <laughs> so I, I thought I, I'm not sure how much weight, but I you know I haven't really looked at the 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 original documents or anything to see you know how much detail we really have there um, about these banquets. But I thought, well, that that seems like a, a pretty weak thing because. You know, that's what kings do, right? They have banquets and, you know, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. All right. Um, we have a four-year gap that corresponds to Xerxes off fighting the Greeks. And we saw that before, uh, 41 to 479. You look back at the history, and we have where he invades Asia and, and that. And, um, and so we also see that gap appear in the Book of Esther. And so that corresponds there, too. Um, we have a depiction of the castle. Um, and and it, it's actually it's inaccurate because they found Xerxes' castle and it, that's what it looks like. And um, and there's a lot of Persian terminology that's used. Uh, if this was written, you know, some people say, oh, this wasn't written until like 200 BC. And um, and but then if you look at it, well, no, there's there's this terminology that's used that was um, the same terminology that was used by the Persians. And um, so it's, it's definitely an ancient book. Uh, we can also tell uh, the rough age of it just based on the style of writing. Like, for instance, the, the Old Testament apocryphal books that were written uh, around 200 BC, the stuff that was written after Malachi, after the Old Testament was, um, books were all written, um, most of it, for one, was written in Aramaic instead of Hebrew. Um, now, part of Daniel was written in Aramaic and... What's the other book? One of the other books. Now I'm drawing a blank all of a sudden. One of the other books is written in Aramaic. Um, but the, the you can look at the, the language that's used, and and you see that this the, the the dialect that's used to write it corresponds with the dialect um, of of that time of other writings from that same time period. So that's one way that historians date. Um, the, the age of a particular document or writing. Um, they, they compare other writings from that same time period. All right, so now some of the arguments against uh, the Book of Esther uh, being a historical event. First of all, uh, you have these, these satrapies. All right, and in the, the writings of Herodotus, it says that... Um, and these are these sort of officials um, under the king, and they Herodotus says that Xerxes had twenty of them, and um, and uh, Esther, the Book of Esther says that he had one hundred and twenty-seven. Right. So we say, oh well, there's an inconsistency. Well, um, the thing is, we also know about the the satraps or satrapies, um, that they were grouped into smaller groups. And so Herodotus may well have just been talking about one particular group of these guys as opposed to all of them, whereas the Book of Esther says this is the sum total of, of all that he had. All right. Um, all right, now this is one worth looking at. Let's just uh, look at Esther 2, verses 5 and 6. So 
don't want to read that. Now there was a Jew in Susa, the capital, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjamite, uh, who had been carried away from Jerusalem. Five and six? Yep. Oh, I'm finished. Right? No, read six. Oh, six. Yeah. Who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. And a lot of carrying away there. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> who was carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar? Mordecai. All right. Now, if that's the case, if it's Mordecai, then that would mean, based on the dating of when that happened, when um, when uh, Nebuchadnezzar carried people away from Jerusalem, that would mean that Mordecai would have to be over 122 years old, and Esther was around his age. All right, this is a problem because <laughs> if if that's the case. If, if Esther were over a hundred years old, she probably wouldn't have been real attracted to the king. You, you no offense. <laughs> she was the same age as close <laughs> Roughly, as yeah. Mordecai? Yeah. <laughs> they were, it was, uh... See, I, I never got that. I always hmm. thought she was younger. Yeah, because Mordecai takes her in as his own daughter. Yeah, he kind of did. They're, but they're, they're close enough in age, though, that, um, that we still have a... There's a significant... It's, she's the... She is the daughter of his uncle. So how do we know that she's similar, close in age? And somewhere I've read in here what she was still beautiful and a virgin mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at 120. <laughs> I say good. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's beautiful, but when you say mm -hmm. how old they were. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that was middle age in those days. <laughs> well, no. It, we can be pretty but it confident says that it in was. verse 7, he had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his un uncle. Oh, the daughter of his uncle. For she had neither father nor mother. Yeah, but it was, okay. Regardless, hmm. she was, all right, so she was younger than him, but, um, but at the same time, it was they would still be in the same generation. They'd be cousins. Hmm. So um, so she still couldn't be that much younger if they were cousins. All right. Now, take a look at this again. Take a look at what it actually says. And and when you when you read it, remember that there was no punctuation in the original. So Um, so l let it, here, let me read it, and and just I'll <coughs> reading the the same text, but just accenting a little bit different. All right, now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. All right. So instead of Mordecai. Instead of Mordecai. Kish, who had been, and actually grammatically, it makes more sense to say because it says son of Kish, who had the grammatically, whenever you hear who, you go back to the most recently mentioned person. The most recently mentioned person is Kish. And so, therefore, if you look at that, and then you look at, all right, Kish. Shimei, Jair, Mordecai, that's what? That's a few generations right there. Oh, well, all of a sudden he's not that old anymore. That means Kish, if he was still around, would have been 120 some years old. But that's his, what, great grandfather? Hmm. So, such a great grandfather. Yeah. The Kish would have been his great grandfather, and so if his great grandfather would have been um, in his hundred and twenties, then that's not a big deal. That makes actually that makes sense, and so it's just a misreading of the text. 
um, to say that, oh, well, Mordecai would have been really old according to this. Oh, well, okay. No, that's not actually what it says. But yeah, in the English, it kind of, it sounds like that, depending how you read it. Um, but it really kind of comes down to how it's punctuated. But my note is, you know, inspired. Mm -hmm. And it says he was 122. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. The inspiration of footnotes. Uh -huh. <laughs> so is mine. Do, does yours? Mm -hmm. Second Kings 24. I think we have the same Bible. Um, RSV. Yeah, that's mine. Same. I mean, same. <laughs> See, now I, I'm using the... the Concordia Self Study Bible, which you know, that's the approved one and all. Oh, so <laughs> it's not the King well, it's, James. It's, 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 not well, yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the well, you know, there's the authorized text, and then there's the authorized text, oh, you know. I see. <laughs> which actually, this one is um, has been uh, supplanted by the new uh, Lutheran Study Bible, anyway. But uh, I, I, I tend to put more credence with the actual text. Than the footnotes, no matter who wrote the footnotes. These footnotes are they're saying that it was his family, not Mordecai. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the next argument was that Esther was not a member of a noble family, and therefore Xerxes could not have taken her as a queen because she wasn't, you know, it's sort of like in uh, in the movie Aladdin. Mm -hmm. She's not a princess, or so he's, he's not a prince. prince, yeah. And so, therefore, you can't get married. And so, this, this is that same argument. Again, kings can do whatever <laughs> they yeah. want. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, um, ironically, if if you what we know about the history is that at least two Persian kings, Darius and Xerxes, um, took wives who were not of noble families. Um, yeah. uh, Xerxes took a wife we know from um, from uh, historians named Amestris, who may have been the same person as Vashti, um, but she wasn't of a noble family either. Mm -hmm. You know, oh well, <laughs> there goes that argument. <laughs> we know yeah. for a fact that <laughs> these guys were in the practice of doing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so if anything, <laughs> the fact that she wasn't part of one, that's almost an argument in favor <laughs> of of the, you know, instead of against. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, now, another argument is the size of the gallows that are built by Haman, mm -hmm. and the reference in 514 and 7-9. Is that the same thing? Is that, I don't yeah, it's the same book. Uh -huh. five, just, yeah, just look for chapter 5. Oh. Yeah, it, it's short. Let's see. I can't read it upside down. There's four. There's five. Uh -huh. And then mm -hmm. just look for verse 14. Okay. All right. So somebody have 514? And this, uh, we'll say Zeresh. The, the name there. Well, they both say 50 cubits high. Don't they? Yeah, 52? 50. 50 cubits high? Right, yeah, 50 cubits. Hmm. Right. Um, which is about 75 feet. Right? That's tall gallows. Right? And and so to have this this humongous gallows built that tall, they they're saying that seems sort of unrealistic to to have it built and built fairly quickly. Seventy five. That would yeah. be a a bit of engineering uh, would have to go into something like that. It, it, it's not unthinkable, but um, it would be pretty big uh, to build. And so now if you look at this. If you look at these two passages, um, what we have here, um, looking at 514, this is a quote of um, of his wife that, and his friends that said, have a gallows built 
and have it built you know, 50 cubits, 75 feet high. All right. So what we have a record of here is not the actual size of it, but they, he was told, have this built mm -hmm. and make it this big. Okay, so then we look at 7-9, uh, and, um, and then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A gallow 75 feet high stands by Haman's house. All right, so again, nowhere does the author of Esther say it actually was 75 feet high. We just have a handful of people saying, Hey, build a 75 foot high gallows. And then somebody else comes along and he says, and you know, if you again sort of think tone of voice here, oh, there's a gallows outside his house and it's like 75 feet high. It's <laughs> <laughs> kind of a random number though. It's well, humongous. But 50 cubits is not a random number though. 50, yeah. you know, we'd say, ah, it's like 50 feet, you know, or, or you know, oh, it's like 50 cubits high. You know, 50 is a kind of a... So a, they're just guessing? Is that what it was? Yeah. It, it looked that big. <laughs> and it, you know, big. it was big. You know, it's it's not like there was... <laughs> it's not like this eunuch, before he went and sent this message, got out there with his tape measure. And, <laughs> yeah. <you know. laughs> That's like these two trees behind my house. They look like something like what I live. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <but> they're probably <laughs> not. big. They really are, but they're big. Yeah. Tell you that. They're about the biggest in the whole park. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, uh, what could we fall. say? What could we say? That happened decades ago. Now a lot of there's a more common people like myself with just this book here. Mm -hmm. Now, who's going to define all of this? It wasn't 75. No, it was 70. It was this. Was a you know the little guys going to accept this book? What is written here? Mm -hmm. Sure. Right. Well, and, I, you know. I, I'm just confused. So they both say the same thing. So now where's the inaccuracy? The, I, the question is, could they build a 75-foot? Because it's not like this was, you know, and God oh, commanded okay. that this thing okay. would appear. It okay. was sort of with the engineering but, capabilities. Uh, when they, they built they the temple in Israel, look at the, all the lumber and things they got, you know. That mm -hmm. was some of the best wood you'll ever find in your life. Sure, yeah. yeah and they certainly, temple. this... Um, <laughs> it was great A stuff. Yeah, and, and the area that they were in, was a very fertile area. Mm -hmm. This this area of you know Persia, mm -hmm. um, you've got the the Tigris and the Euphrates flowing mm -hmm. through there. There's just mm -hmm. there's like what you four different major water rivers water. going yeah. through there, I think. Um, and uh, and and so it's it's a very fertile area. You've got a lot of good wood. And so yeah, could they have built it? Yeah, they could. But if someone really wanted to argue that they weren't capable of it, well. It technically doesn't actually say the book. It, you know, all it does is quote people that said it was that tall. So, I mean, for me, it, could it have been seventy-five feet high? Sure. But you know what? If you start reading at verse nine in chapter five, this sounds like a whole group of people had gotten together, and the king was angry because Mordecai didn't bow and scrape before him. And they're sitting around, and the king's complaining. And Zeresh says, build a, build a gallows a thousand feet high and hang him on it. Hang him high. Yeah. You know, she's yeah. being, she's being um, using hyperbole and really exaggerating. Yeah. So then, you know, yeah. the whole story is going around the kingdom. <gasps> She oh, said, "Yeah, the beach was this long." So yeah. I, <laughs> it's it's sort of like oh, our poor atheist we studied. I mean, before, he, these people who who nitpick, as you said, Bill, who nitpick about this, they don't know who they're dealing with. God tells the truth in every word in mm -hmm. the scripture. Yep. Mm -hmm. And my yep. footnote says it's probably Amen. hyperbole, <laughs> or it's possible that it was. Um, Erected atop some other structure to achieve that height, like the city wall or something. Oh, oh yeah, that and that's a good possibility too. If they, you know, and especially if you were going to make an example out of somebody. And that's probably what she meant. The queen meant was. You know, that yeah, stick it out. Well, Where mount it right on top of the city, so so the gallows itself isn't that high. But happens. once it's mounted on top of the the city wall, then it's that much higher, you know, than already. 
So, but yeah, I mean, it's not. Again, this is this is what we're doing is answering the critics. You know, for mm -hmm. us to look at this, we say, "Hey, word of God," you know, I accept it. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, but when you know when people come along and they say, "How can you say that it's the word of God?" And we can say, "Because it is." All right. But at the same time, for those who say, "But that just doesn't seem to coincide with what we know from history," and you say, "Well." You know, let's take let's take a look at it. Well, you know, if if you're going to make that argument, it's a that's a pretty empty argument. You have to do better than that if you're going to try and discredit mm -hmm. God's word. All right. Um, and then just a, a couple more. Uh, the unalterable laws we see in 119 and 88. Um, I still have 88 here. Now write another decree in the king's name on behalf of the Jews that seems best to you and seal it with the king's signet ring. For no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. And, uh, and somebody have 119. Okay, if 119. If it please the king, let a royal order go forth from him and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it may not be altered that Vashti is to come no more before King Asherus, and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. Well, I don't know why they use that. What nationality is King Xerxes? Is he? He'd be Persian. He? And a Persian is what Roman? No, it would be. Um, th it's it's in that well, it's it's in that same area where nowadays we um, what we call Iraq. Uh -huh. Um. Yeah, that, that same area, and for a while it was called Babylon, for a while it was called, or Babylonia, uh, for a while it was called Persia. Um, it's also the, uh, <laughs> the location of the Garden of Eden. A lot of trouble. They did find Confirm. that, right? Huh? They did find it? No, but the book of Genesis says that it was between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, and that's where they are. So, um, so why do they use these unalterable laws as a a reason that say it's inaccurate. Well, because they seem that there's no, there's nothing in in the history books that uh, the you know the ancient documents that we can find of anything about unalterable laws, right? Except, um, oh. well, for one, which is an argument from silence for one, because it's not like we know everything about the history from no. back then. Now the other thing is there was also a, um, a passage from a guy by the name of uh, Diodorus writing about Darius the third and it reads it was not possible for what was done by the royal authority to be undone this is from that same time period oh well so there was stuff that couldn't be undone once it was done so even that you know it's an argument from silence well yeah <laughs> until somebody finds the rest of it. <laughs> and oh mm -hmm. well we just filled in that gap well there goes that argument and I'm sure it was just a given, you know, if the order is given by the king, you're just going to follow it, no more questions asked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the king can change it if he wants to. Yeah. Yeah. Because he can just make a new law, and then that one can't be undone. <laughs> and, all right, uh, so then we have, uh, according to, a lot of the stuff is from this guy Herodotus, um, and, uh, and he says that Xerxes only had one wife, um, and her name was Amestris, which could be Vashti. Um, Which could be what? Vashti, who oh, is oh, oh, we're gonna. Oh, okay. She's the one that he deposed. But I don't think it matches up in scripture that he married her. She was the queen. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, no. There. Okay, that's that's an interesting question because you've got, um, for one, sometimes you'd have they'd be married to somebody, but that person's not actually a queen. Mm -hmm. Right. Other times you've got where they're sort of. They're married, but it's more of a political alliance. Um, uh, Solomon did a lot <coughs> of that. Um, you and, and where it's it's not really marriage the way that you know we think of marriage. It was it was more to, to bring peace to two nations or something like that. Um, you know, and if you think <coughs> of um, maybe Herodotus really liked Vashti and preferred that she be queen. Right, and that's a good point, is why are we saying that the author of, of Esther had to be wrong and Herodotus was right when they disagree? You know, 
if I'm gonna if I'm gonna throw my chip in with one of them, it's gonna be with God. <laughs> you know, maybe Herodotus got that wrong, <laughs> or maybe you know the other thing is it's sort of like when you say um, if, if someone says, um, "Oh, my uh, my my daughter's in dance," and I say, "Oh, I have a daughter who's in dance." All right? Am I saying that I only have one daughter? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, but um, you know, and so sometimes people will will take stuff like that where it, it mentions just this one person, and they assume that that means that there's only one, and whereas no, that's not what it says. You know, it, it just it depends how you read it, and so again, you know, these are these are really weak arguments, and the other one um, is just the question of okay, if Mordecai became this major figure in Persia. Why don't we find any reference to him in other uh, documents? Which is, again, an argument from silence. But all over the place in these ancient documents from that time period, we find reference to a guy by the name of Marduk. Hmm. Hmm. Oh. See, Marduk was the sort of the king of the Persian gods and the Babylonian gods. All right. And and so just like you have um, in in the in Islam, you have a lot of people name their kids Muhammad, all right? Well, it's that same sort of thing that you know Marduk was their god, and 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 so people would name their kids after their god, right? And so um, even though Mordecai was a Jew, he um, he would have had uh, especially if he was working. Um, within the king's courts, he would have had to have a name that people could pronounce. Mm -hmm. And so you, you take on a, a, a local name. I haven't read <laughs> you <didn't> pronounce. <laughs> yeah, okay. See, for them to pronounce, not for right. us to pronounce. <laughs> okay. So, so those are the, you know, so now you've seen, these are the arguments against Esther being a historical book, right? And we see that all of these arguments are either very weak or they've already been shown to be non-arguments because what they, the claims that they make are actually false claims or, or arguments from silence and some of those have already, the silent gap has already been filled in. Um, it, it just, it always amuses me when people say, well, you know, we don't, from, you know, in archaeology, we don't find this. And then it's like, we'll just keep digging. I was going to say, not yet. <laughs> yeah. And, and it just, you know, the, the more they do, the more they find. And, and, and everything they find always agrees with the Bible. And it, it just, for us, we, you know, we see these new discoveries and we just go, told you. <laughs> and, but, you know, it, it, a lot of times it, it makes the headlines and, of course, it makes the headlines more if it's something that seems to be a contradiction, no matter how weak of an argument, like, oh, well, we've we found a, a grave that's marked Jesus, son of Joseph, and so there couldn't possibly be another Jesus who had a father named Joseph right. in Israel, <laughs> even though those were both extremely common names. <laughs> and uh, so, but, but, you know, the... People are always looking for stuff to discredit the Bible, but the reality is the archaeology, the history, everything, what we find is true. And every time every time we think that there's something that's not, it's just a matter of time before they do a little more digging and they go, oh, we were misinterpreting that evidence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. hmm? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, there goes that, that argument. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, uh, who is the author of this? Is Esther is one of the books where um, we don't have an actual author given in the book. Uh, I already mentioned Ezra uh, being <laughs> one of the possibilities, um, and uh, according to Josephus, who is uh, um, uh, he wrote during about the first or second um, century A.D. He says that Mordecai wrote it. Um, he was a Josephus was a Jew. And um, 
and in the Talmud, uh, which is a collection of, of Jewish writings, it says the great men, of, uh, the men of the great synagogue in Ezra's day wrote it. And so did Ezra write it? Did somebody um, from Ezra's time, one of, one of Ezra's uh, sort of assistants or, or you know, contemporaries or whatever write it? We don't really know. It's not all that important um, who wrote it. It would be important if it said it was written by somebody, well, then we would say, then that's who wrote it. But it doesn't say. It's sort of like in the New Testament, we have the, the book of Hebrews, um, which we don't know who wrote it. And there's a lot of speculation, and, and it's interesting to, to sort of to wonder. Um, but we can't say for sure. Right? Um, the theme. We have uh, two main themes that run through this. First of all, the Jews flourishing in a foreign land. Right? They've been taken out of Israel into Persia in, Persia in captivity, and uh, and so they're, they're to them their land was very important to them. It was the promised land, and so to be taken out of there uh, that was a really hard thing for them. And yet they still flourished where they were at, um, and which ties in with the second theme, and that is God's providence and His hiddenness that. Um, that even though you're not in this particular place, God's still going to take care of you. Which actually in that time period was a huge thing. Because people at that time believed that a God was tied to his particular plot of land. It could be a mountain. Um, that That's where that God is powerful. And boy, you get away from there and he loses his power. And But, but the Jews said, oh, we worship the maker of heaven and earth. All right? Where is his particular place of influence everywhere <laughs> <laughs> right so can god take care of us even when we're off in this foreign land well yeah that's his place too all of these places are his places and and you know anybody that thinks that their god is more powerful than our god wherever their god doesn't even exist so how could their god possibly be more powerful than our god who is the true living god and um so, so nowadays we sort of take that for granted, but in that day, that was that was really a big deal. All right. So now, this is this is a fascinating quote, um, Martin Luther, on the Book of Esther. Right. Um, he said, "I am so great an enemy to the Second Book of the Maccabees and to Esther that I wish that they had not come to us at all." For they have too many heathen unnaturalities. The Jews much more esteemed the book of Esther than any of the prophets, though they were forbidden to read it before they had attained the age of 30 by reason of the mystic matters it contains. Oh, that Luther, what does he know, right? Okay, now... He was kind of a stick in the mud. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. But, okay, now here's the strange thing. If you read the book of Esther, which we will, right? What is he talking about? Mystic matters that it contains. The book of Esther is one of the most oh, down-to-earth books in the whole Bible. What do you mean mystic? So I was doing a little research on this quote. And as it turns out, if you go back to find where this was originally quoted, the guy that quoted him said, oh, that was supposed to say Esdras. Not Esther. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> now, Esdras... Isn't that interesting? Esdras was an Old Testament apocryphal book, which is usually referred to as First and Second Esdras, because it's long. And in fact, First Esdras is the book of Ezra with an addendum at the end of it that was tacked on. This, and this, this appears around 200 B.C. or so. Second Ezra has absolutely nothing to do with, I mean, it's, it's supposed to take place during the same time period. Whether it's historical or not, we don't know. But there's, there's some really weird stuff in there, like Ezra walks up to this woman and touches her, and she turns into a city. <laughs> <laughs> which, which actually, you know, you, oh, that's really bizarre. And I thought about it, and I thought, well, actually, you know, we see in the book of Revelation where New Jerusalem is referred to as the Bride of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so to have a woman compared to a city... Is, is really not that strange for the Bible, but at the same time, to you know, to sort of, 
Transformers, you know, <laughs> touch the woman and boom, she's a city. You know? <laughs> wow. <laughs> and uh, you know, so there's a really so then when you think of that, you oh, oh, that makes a lot more sense than Esther, because what, I mean, I I could see him not liking Esther because it's very sort of pro Jew. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. as far as being, you know, unnaturalities and, and mystic matters, that's just none of that in there. What, what are you talking about? Oh, Esdras. Oh, now it makes sense. All right. So if you ever hear people, um, and this is, this is not commonly known. I, I found this quote about Esther all over the place. I found one person that actually did the, the history work. And traced this quote back, and went, "Oh, uh, guys, <laughs> he wasn't talking about Esther." Hmm, interesting. And um, hmm. but you see, I mean, and the thing is, people like to quote this who don't like Luther, because I, I one of the things that I came across when I um, when I was researching this was um, Luther referred to as the first Nazi. Oh, gee. <laughs> A lot of people oh, like to blame really? Luther because he wrote the book on the Jews and their lies. Which he said some pretty nasty things like burn their synagogues and, and stuff like that. And in, in his later years, he got very frustrated with the Jews because um, he thought, and, and speaking now of the Jews, religious Jews, not their, like the ethnic group, uh, important to make that distinction. He didn't have, he wasn't, you know, racist. Um, what it was is that he was, um, he thought that, boy, you know, the reason that the Jews don't believe in Jesus is because all they've ever heard is all this works righteousness stuff, right? But boy, if they hear the gospel, man, they're just going to come flocking because it's so great and it just it just makes perfect sense with the Old Testament and Jesus is all over the place in the Old Testament. He thought, this is going to be great, all right? And then they didn't. Went, what? What's your problem? It's so obvious, you know? And so because of that, in his later years, he was, he was sick, and, and, and I think that um, the, that sort of, um, because of, of the pain that he was in and, and, and how, you know, it, the, I think that it was, I don't know if I want to say affecting his mind, but definitely affecting his emotions. And, and so he wrote, and he wrote, and Luther always wrote pretty strongly. All right, but that particular document is really sort of out of character for him. He's like, boy, what were you taking <laughs> for the pain that caused you to write like that? <laughs> and you know, whether it was, to, you know, so it was a combination of of the, his poor health and 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 that, and, and so you know, and that's why we like to emphasize that as Lutherans, we don't believe um, what Luther said. You know, our our sort of formative documents are the Lutheran confessions. That's if you want to know what Lutherans believe. You can't just quote Luther because Luther contradicted himself. You look at his early Luther and later Luther, they're very different. Um, because in his early years, he was still a loyal Catholic, Roman Catholic, and, um, and, and was just trying to clean things up. And after a while, he sort of gave up on that and, and realized how much of, of the Roman Catholic teachings he disagreed with. And um, and so then he stopped trying to make it work um, with Roman Catholic teaching. Is this I'm just going to focus on the Bible and you know. Um, so yeah, so this quote, um, you know, if you ever hear somebody say, "Well, Luther didn't like you know the Book of Esther," well, now it, we know. Yeah, now you know. So you you are you are among an elite group mm. because the really, you know, of the people that in the world that actually know. What he what this quote actually originally was? There's really not that many because he's been so misquoted so much um, that most people are only familiar with this as referring to Esther. So a um, couple other uh, references: uh, Clement uh, writing to the Corinthians around somewhere between AD 30 and 100 uh, said, "Esther also, being perfect in faith, exposed herself to no less danger." in order to deliver the twelve tribes of Israel from impending destruction. But with fasting and humiliation, she entreated the everlasting God who sees all things, and he, perceiving the humility of her spirit, delivered the people for whose sake she had encountered peril. And so there we have 
Clement, who uh, was very favorable toward Esther. I have to apologize for the, the little milk carton thing there. Uh, something happened that it, it it looked better, you know, when I put this oh, thing together. It looked better in the bulletin. Yeah, the one in the bulletin. Because if you go to the website, I I, uh, I found a milk carton thing. But and there's a long story why I didn't just redo it on here. Uh, it has to do with document formats and things <laughs> like that. Um, so so I, I'm sorry that that doesn't look good. But um, the, the idea being that God doesn't appear in here. If you go looking for God in the book of Esther, um, you're not going to find him actually, you know, the way that you would in, in most books. Uh, but he's still there, uh, which we will see. All right. Um, and one more quote, Matthew Henry uh, in the early 1700s, if the name of God is not there in Esther, his finger is. And that's one of the themes of Esther. That's one of the important points of the book of Esther. All right. Um, so next time we'll uh, we'll finish up with the preliminaries and then we'll get into the actual book. So, um, <coughs> much thought and uh, we'll close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, for your presence with us. Uh, keep us always mindful that you promised that you would be with us always to the close of the age. And, and so uh, we hold you to that promise. We know that you will be with us. And uh, we know that you that you love us as you always have assured us that you do. And uh, just give us faith to trust that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I want to uh, also thank uh, the two of you who are watching with us online. And uh, if you use the chat box, let us know where you're uh, where you're writing from me or where you're uh, watching from. We'd love to know that. Uh, so, and otherwise, uh, if anybody else is watching this after the fact, uh, every Sunday night at 7 o'clock Eastern, uh, we will be here, except for the 4th of July, so you know, that one's not going to work uh, so well. And, uh, but otherwise, you can catch us down there. It's always going to be recorded for anybody to catch later on.